Happy September, everybody. In this video, I'm going to try to break down a full month of chess action and drama at the end of it in about 15 minutes. The FIDE Online Chess Olympiad took place from July 25th to August 30th. If you haven't caught up on your chess news, India and Russia had a really strange conclusion to the whole thing. And you can use the timeline in the video player to just jump ahead to me covering games from the final and the drama that took place. But if you want to watch the entire story unfold, please do so. Uh, I'm going to be talking through the entirety of it and showing you various graphics. So let's get started. This beautiful graphic uh, just talks about the information. It was a tournament that lasted over 30 days, which is pretty wild. That is kind of rare in chess. And this is the format, which you don't have to read a lot into, uh, but it was 163 teams. Now, the interesting thing is the Olympiad is usually four players competing. This one was six and required uh, the countries to feature uh, their female players, as well as a, a, a boy and a girl who were under 20 years old. So some really strong junior players to give them a chance to play. Uh, then we had things called divisions. Now, what does that mean? So we start out in the base division. The base division is the bottom 30 teams in the Olympiad that took place in 2018. And you split those 30 teams into three pools of 10. Okay, so 10, 10, 10. They all play against each other, round robin, and the top four teams, so four times three is 12, move up and play into division four. And division four features those 12 teams and 38 teams that ranked above those teams in 2018. So you just basically move up, right? You keep moving up and moving up. So division four is split now into five pools of 10 and three top teams continue their climb up. Lebanon was a country that made it through two divisions. And ultimately what this results in is uh, division three and the same process is redone for division three and then we have division two more familiar countries like Germany and Spain and Italy begin to enter the mix uh, and ultimately you end up in the top division so 15 teams come from division two up into the top division and the top division has five top finishers from the uh, concluded Olympiad in 2018. So Russia, China, USA, Ukraine, and India, the top five. And the countries chosen uh, from the four continents. So Armenia, Azerbaijan, Poland, Georgia, Mongolia, right? So different continents selecting five powerhouse chess teams like Peru, Canada, and so on, on your screen. Uh, and then these teams end up competing to qualify for a 12-player playoff. 12-team playoff, 12-player playoff, however you want to call it. Now, if you are at the top of those groups, you auto-qualify to the quarterfinal, okay? And the other eight compete amongst themselves to see who seeds against you in the quarterfinals. You can go game by game and an extremely useful resource to keep in mind for all of this is something I'm about to show you. Uh, FIDE created an incredible website for this. Check this out. So this is the official FIDE website. Uh, I'll obviously link it in the description and probably pin a comment as well. You have the entire schedule. You have all the teams that made it. Uh, and at the same time, you also have the archive of what took place. So you can look division by division of who competed and who did well across what pools. See, India, Azerbaijan, Russia, and uh, the United States won their respective pools, so they qualified for the quarterfinals. Uh, and if we back up, we see what happened in the quarterfinals. So Greece lost to Armenia, 2-0. to zero. Uh, Poland defeated Bulgaria, 2-0. to zero. So six games, followed by six games. Uh, obviously, it's six players per team, right? Uh, Germany and Hungary competed, and uh, Germany uh, actually lost to Hungary in an Armageddon, right? So in an Armageddon, one to zero, uh, China, Ukraine, maybe in surprising fashion, Ukraine actually was the winner. Now, the first bit of drama came in this quarterfinal matchup up here between India and Armenia. And basically what happened in that matchup was the fact that... Uh, the 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 uh, the Indian team uh, Nihal Sarin, very strong player, was playing Haik Martirosian, 
And what happened was Hayek disconnected, okay? So Hayek disconnected in what more or less was a drawn endgame, uh, and they lost the match. They lost three and a half, two and a half, and India took a one nothing lead. Uh, Armenia appealed to the International Chess Federation, and their appeal was turned down. They, Although they tried to prove that there was a, a disconnect of some sort, no official statement has been made. One is coming from FIDE and Chess.com and all these things. And so Armenia decided not to play the second match at all. They just forfeited, and India moved on to the semifinals. Uh, Azerbaijan versus Poland. It was actually Poland victorious. Russia, Hungary, Russia, and USA defeated Ukraine. Which then brings me uh, to the semifinals. In the semifinals, not, nothing too complicated occurred. Uh, India defeated Poland. I India uh, actually came back after losing 4-2 to against Poland in the first game and winning the Armageddon. And Russia and USA, Russia just won in convincing fashion. Which brings us to the final. And in the final, we had India versus Russia, an incredibly strong matchup. If we click on this, it allows you to look at who was going up against who. Bid it, Hare Krishna, Conor Humpy, uh, Harika Dronavali, Prague, and as, as well as uh, Divya Deshmukh, who is a 14-year-old superstar. And if you look across the other side, they, I mean, they're equally stacked, right? So in their first leg, all the games were drawn. All of the chess drama begins right around now in the second wave of games. Nepo versus Vichy was a draw. Dubov Vidit was a draw. Garachkina won against Conor Ruhambi and they were up by a game. It was two and a half, one and a half. It was at this moment that the, these two boards, Nihal Sarin and Divya Deshmukh, disconnected. And... Because of this, India lost on two boards and filed an appeal. And so the difference between India's disconnection and the Armenian disconnection, as I understand it, and it has been relatively public but a little bit confusing, was the fact that uh, there was a cloud flare problem. There was a global outage and... This went to FIDE, it was ruled a different situation than the Armenian situation, and the FIDE president, Arkady Dvorkovic, made a statement, which will, I will also link in the description, uh, and he basically said, both teams will be ruled winners of the Olympiad. And personally, I don't think that this is the right decision at all. Uh, I won't mince words. Uh, many, many Russian fans were unhappy. They said, how can you win an Olympiad without winning a single game? But at the same time, people were saying, well, uh, Polina Shuvalova playing against Divya was busted. She was completely lost at the time of the disconnect. Uh, Divya would have went on to win that game. We have an even match, right? And then you look at the Yesipenko Sarin position, etc. But they were saying, well, India was going to win that game if, if not for the disconnection. People were saying, okay, I'm going to make it very clear. I don't think that you should just award two winners. Uh, you should maybe reschedule the matches for another day. I mean, the first match was totally even. Maybe you start with a handicap, one to zero on a certain board. But people wouldn't be happy with that either because Divya was in a winning position all the same. So, but I still think it's better than just making this sweeping claim that there can be two gold medals. I don't know what the right decision is. I think that you should let me know what the right decision is. Let me know in the comments whether you're a fan from India, Russia, or just a spectator watching from anywhere in the world. At this point, I will look at some of the games played in the final, and then we will talk about just what this means for online chess moving forward. Uh, there was a super fascinating game between Vidit and, and Jan, and Agad Mator Antonio, he, he already covered uh, this game, uh, but I will kind of breeze through it. It was another Grunfeld defense from Jan. This was in round one of the final. Uh, we got a super complicated D5, B5, line from Nepo, which he's been playing a lot. He's been playing it in these online tours. Bishop takes c5, rook c8, a pawn sacrifice. The most exciting moment of this game comes right around, in the in almost close to move 30, where it looks like uh, Jan's pieces are all set up, but there's about to be a castles here, and it's going to be completely safe. And he detonates rook takes f2 on Vidit, and forces Vidit to bring his king directly into a double check. 
And I'm not covering the intricacies of the variations. It's already kind of a long video uh, and Antonio already did a great job. So shout out to him. But uh, what ultimately ended up happening is that he had to leave his king in the center. And despite being a full rook up, Vidit basically had to repeat moves. And if we look, we take stock. He's a full rook up, but he never moved his h1 rook this entire game. So a fascinating Grunfeld between Vidit uh, and Nepo, which results in, in repetition. And the spicy games come from the matchup between Gorachkina and Hampi Konaru from the second wave of games. Uh, this was a Queen's Gambit decline. I just made a video on this if you haven't seen it already. A very solid Queen's Gambit declined with this pawn structure and Gorachkina plays in brilliant fashion. First, she strikes in the center and creates a pass pawn, which then is supported by her pieces. She brings the pawn to a very nice square and plays knight g5, threatening mate, which forces uh, Humpy to make this trade bishop for knight, and now the bishop can always come in here and defend the pawn. And from here on out, Goryachkina brought her rooks to the center of the board, traded the bishop for the knight, and proceeded to create weaknesses on the queen side by moving her a-pawn. A fantastic game of chess, all while creating a luft for the king to not get back ranked and to put two rooks in support of this pawn. So she plays in the center, on the right side and on the left side, as you see. Absolutely brilliant play. Uh, and there you have it, creating this weakness, breaking up the structure and winning a long, long, long endgame with the queen and the two rooks. First, she won a pawn and basically invested full time into d7. Then she won a second pawn, which Humpy sacrificed but created an unbreakable barrier and slowly, slowly improved her position. Also utilizing the clock, stabilizing, pressuring, and found a way in low time to finally, around here, play the very important move, f6. Sacrificing a pawn, but allowing the king in. And there you go. She breaks through the defense and finally is able to destroy all the remaining pawns and get a rook trade, and that secures the victory. Humpy's rook did not move for the entire half of the second, uh, the, the entire second half of the game, I should say, uh, and it was uh, Goryachkina who won. And that brings me to the game between Divya uh, and Polina Shuvalova, and Polina Shuvalova is a uh, world junior champion. This was a King's Indian uh, attack setup, uh, and Polina played in relatively standard fashion, bishop e7, bishop b7, b5 prevents c4 early on, and here we just saw expert play. Uh, if you're looking for a closed attacking weapon as an intermediate and an advanced player, look no further than the king's Indian attack, where you lock up the center and then play h4, rotate in the knight, h5, h6, and so on. Uh, you shut down your opponent's play on the queen side and watch as she methodically starts transferring all her pieces to I the king. Then she plays d4, locking the center even more, and reroutes her bishop. Look at this climb, right? The bishop, the crawl, not the climb. To c2, king g2, rook h1, and it was here, after 10 meticulous improving moves, that Divya disconnected. And people were saying, look, she's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight M's in her bank account. Five pieces lined up directly at Polina's king. Of course she's going to win this game. You plug it into any engine, it's already saying plus three. It's completely lost. Her next move was going to be knight to e3. Get this knight out. g4, g5. Bring the second rook. And she very well might have won this game. But the story ends right here. The disconnect happened. And after deliberation, the FIDE president, despite being Russian by, by nationality, ruled actually in favor of India, some might say, because India was down a game ultimately at the time, and this game is, is not done. I mean, it's there's a lot of pieces on the board. Divya definitely has a better position and is most likely going to go on to win, but things can happen, especially as time gets lower. I did say this was going to be a 15-minute recap, right? Well, we're basically there. Hopefully this sums up an entire month of chess for you. The FIDE Chess Olympiad was an incredible spectacle and it sucks that it had to end on a sour note. Positive for some chess fans, but in my opinion, you don't award two gold medals. You look for a competitive stand to it. Uh, Kostinyuk, Nepo, 
Levon Aronian, so many people tweeting around the world. Twitter was a whirlwind. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. And if you're going to debate with somebody, be nice. Don't be toxic. Don't be disgusting. And if you just adamantly disagree with somebody's comment, just don't write something nasty. Just back away. Take a second. Breathe. But I want to open up the conversation to all of you. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, even though normally I obviously do focus a lot more on chess. And that's all for now. I'll catch you in another video tomorrow.